after after I say this, then you can say that. Okay. And then we'll start. Okay. okay. Yeah. Good morning. Welcome to the meeting 17 of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. Councillor Wong Tam has another engagement today, and I'm Rahima Mullah. I will be chairing this meeting. Nicole? Thank you. We would like to begin the meeting to acknowledge that we are meeting today on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of the New Credit First Nation, the Haudenosaunee the Huron-Wendat, and the home of many indigenous, um, diverse indigenous peoples. Thank you. Thanks, Nicole. I'll now call the meeting to order at 9.30. We will start introductions. Can each member and staff introduce themselves? Starting with Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. Mike Layton, I'm the City Councillor for Ward 19, Trinity Spadina. I'm Stephanie Osario, and I'm a committee member. Yin Brown, committee member. Nicole Cormier, Accessibility Consultant, Equity, Diversity, and Human Rights Division. Rahima Mola, Vice Chair. Janice Dick, City Clerk's Office. Carol Kostinen, City Clerk's Office. Martin Cursells, a committee member. Wendy Porch, committee member. Monica Winkler, committee member. And on the outside of the horseshoe. Melissa Wong, Councillor Wong Tam's office. Uh, Matthew Cowley from the city clerk's office. And on the other side of the horseshoe. I'm Deirdre Boyle. I'm an accessibility consultant working with Nicole in the equity, diversity, and human rights division. Okay, thank you. Lynn Genova, clerks. All right, before we proceed with the agenda, is there any conflict of interest? under the Municipal Conflict of Interest Act? None. Okay. Uh, we need a motion to confirm the minutes of the September 27th meeting. Who motions? Uh, Martin, seconded by? Uh, no second, all right. All those in favor? Carried. Just a minute, please. All right, I need a motion to change the order of the agenda. Um, which item am I doing? Okay, I'm motion to move item three, the working group, working group reports to item two. Councillor Layton, thank you. All in favor? Carried. Um, we're moving.
We had a deferred item from the last meeting forward movement campaign. The press centers were not able to be at this meeting, so it will be on the December 4th agenda. And now the chair's report. Human resources presentation deferred to December tact meeting. Sidewalks for all campaign. Report on sidewalk cafes have been postponed to December the 4th, 2017. This will be the same day as the next TACT meeting. Outreach to city councillors is being led by Yin Brown. Campaign is live at sidewalksforall.ca. Public demonstration is on November 29th at 1230 on the second floor of City Hall. Sidewalks for all is a coalition su campaign supported by the Center for Independent Living, CILT, Walk Toronto, Canadian Institute for the Blind, CNIB, Alliance for Equality of Blind Canadians. On December 4th, Councillor Wong Tam will be hosting a holiday appreciation lunch for members of the Toronto Accessibility uh, Committee immediately after the December 4th meeting. The lunch will take place in the committee room one from 12.30 to 1.30. Thank you. Okay, Yen. Uh, since I've been uh, working with Councillor Wong Tam and the coalition on the sidewalks campaign, may I just elaborate a little bit because we would really like the support of uh, this committee. Yes. Okay, so what it is is that um, we, we are gathering photos, videos and stories of uh, all pedestrians that encounter challenges when they try to access sidewalks so that it can be posted on the uh, www.sidewalksforall.ca. And we are very um, uh, happy that Elisa from Councilor Wong Tam's uh, office is supporting us with this. So if you, your committee, uh, wants to submit photos or, or stories of how challenging it has been um, in accessing sidewalks safely uh, due to narrow, you know, or obstructions or outdoor patios, please do that. But also what was mentioned is that we would really like people to approach the 10 key councillors that sit on the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee and the Licensing and Standards Committee. It's a joint committee. They're meeting on December 4th. And we would like, to, and also, yeah, so we would like people to approach these councillors to explain to them why it is important for us to have, uh, for, for our, our uh, community, disability community, but not only just us, you know, seniors, children, you know, mothers with baby carriages, and just people with bags, to, to have a uh, 2.1 meter minimum, straight, unobstructed, clear way. We are not against outdoor cafes and marketing, but that these things, the new bylaws will not um, infringe, uh, further obstruct the sort of safe and access, uh, access of pedestrians. So if you can um, sort of rally your organizations or your contacts, your networks to, to speak to counselors, there is a list of people that, that we would like to gather to, to speak to these counselors. And of course, as mentioned, um, November 20th, 29th, just outside of this committee room, we like to show people, especially counselors, uh, what 2.1 meter looks like, what 1.5 meter looks like, and how that is uh, both of these uh, the widths are, are uh, suitable or not suitable for, for Thank pedestrians. Thank you, Yen. Thank you. Okay, so now um, we'll have the reports from the working group. Motion to receive Yen's item for information. Um, Monica? All those in favor? And carried. Okay, working groups. Communications group, Yen? Oh, me again. And you again. 
Is this on? Okay, so we met on October 6th, the communications com um, working group. So basically we worked on and check, followed up on our action points. So uh, Darren followed up with um, um, Janice to, about, uh, on our, the wording of our motions, which we uh, hope to present today. Um, also, that's regarding how um, organizations wanting city funding um, to have an accessibility plan. Um, um, also, what was uh, not yet done, but we hope if we can do something like that this meeting or next, that to have a joint motion with the housing working group on um, on. Um, making sure that shelters uh, have clear and accessible communication to the public on what kind of accessibility features are, uh, are there for, uh, at the shelters and what shelter facilities are, 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 are available because often people with disabilities, especially sensory, they may not be getting all this uh, kind of information on services available. So that um, we, we hope to collaborate with the housing com uh, committee. Um, and the last one is uh, Stephanie was to follow up with Nicole, and uh, rem uh, I, we were very happy that Nicole gave us, uh, sort of consulted our group on what s sort of details should be inserted in the uh, new accessibility plan and policy, the city accessibility policy and plans. So we, we are following up with Nicole to see how many of our recommendations have been uh, adopted, and Stephanie would like to be on that. Uh, that group working on that uh, that that uh, accessibility p plan and policy, um, yeah. And our next meeting is in November. Thank you, Yen. Okay, um, employment group, Wendy. I wish I had more to say about what the employment working group's doing. But as we discussed at our last meeting, we're still waiting on a presentation that we requested in March. Um, so I, I just wanted to put that back out there. It's March that we requested it. It's been seven months. Um, the working group, we stated, we stated clearly time and again, we're not meeting until we have that presentation because it's very hard for us to see how we're going to move ahead. So as I've said previously, it's considered to be our baseline. We haven't had any response yet. So we were assured at the last meeting it would be at this meeting. So I wonder if I could just ask for some feedback on where that's at and when we can actually expect to see it. I was expecting staff from HR to be present to um, give an update verbally. Um, it's my understanding that they're planning on presenting at the December meeting. Thanks, Wendy. Yeah, Councillor Davis. It's my understanding that they are going to be presenting at the December meeting of the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee. But or is but it November 29th? What's our, our next meeting is Janice? December. But have they met December with the subcommittee? The working? They're not required to meet with us. We just, we've made a request that was quite detailed at the March meeting of the information that we were looking for. Uh, to be presented to us. So we're, we're actually just waiting to see the presentation. Okay. Um, but we've been expecting it since we requested it in March. So. All right, thank you. Okay, there's not a report from housing, uh, transportation, Monica. Hi. Um, we met on, well, um, <clears throat> Excuse me, Martin and I met on um, on Thursday, October the 19th using Zoom, which was awesome. I suggest it highly for people who are having trouble meeting. Um, and um, we have a couple of, of items that we want to move forward with. Um, we would like to find out if there are any regulations for construction sites on public spaces to ensure accessibility around obstructions. Um, and there are two examples that Martin um, did send out. Um, the first is uh, he uh, walked across the driveway at Kennedy Station 
and there was new tar had been laid on half of it, and he's sure there were signs, but there were definitely no barriers, and so he got dirty. Um, and luckily his dog did not sustain any injuries, which was good. The second one was the construction at Eglinton Crosstown, um, and uh, it seems that to go, she had, uh, his wife uses a wheelchair, and she had to go onto Eglinton Avenue because both sidewalks on either side of the street had been dug out and no alternative paths were given. So um, we would like to know who to contact about this. Um, we would also like to know what regulations are and how they are enforced. And um, are there different regulations for TTC construction sites as opposed to other construction sites on city streets? Um, uh, so, and then secondly, we would like to motion to arrange a time for public works to come to the TAA to our meeting um, uh, to and present the final rules for the Bloor Street bike lanes. Um, we would like to give input for future bike lane construction, and we want to know what they settled on for the Bloor Street ones. Um, I did ask Janice and Melissa what to do, and they say that we should. Um, uh, we will be bringing these items with a motion to the December 4th meeting and we'll be on the agenda then. Thank you, Monica. Disability and policing. Oh, uh, Councillor Davis, you have a question? Um, what will be on the December agenda, your recommendations, or will staff be here? A motion um, okay. to find out um, what no. their regulations are for construction sites on public spaces about around accessibility, and is the TTC no. under the same regulations or different ones? And then the second one will be um, for <clears throat> Public Works to come and uh, um, and present to us what they what the final um, rules are for the Bloor Street bike lanes because there's been a lot of discussion so, about changes and such, and they've just approved it and it's going to council right. shortly. Right. It, it is. Um, but why wouldn't we request to have transportation services come to the December meeting to answer your questions? I was too late for, to put that on the agenda for today. Really? Oh, today we have, we have a any full motions agenda. Arising out of these reports today? Very slow if, it, if we can't move motions arising out of verbal reports. But. Right. Disability and policing report. Uh, Monica? No, no. I have nothing to report on that. No. Okay. Thank you. All right. Wendy? Just to say officially, I don't think there, there is anything to report. I'm on the committee as well. Um, we're still in discussions, so we're still collecting research and we're still having some discussions. Okay, thank you. All right, so thank you to, oh, and you have a question? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, regarding um, inviting public works or transportation to come in and, and uh, let, uh, letting us know about the cycle paths, um, that was my concern as well. Is it, what's the timeline? Anybody knows, like, if, if certain things get passed by uh, council and our concerns about safety and accessibility uh, for people with disabilities is not brought up in time, so is December 4th, uh, it's still okay. <laughs> I'm asking. Um, like, Ian, it's Monica. Um, the, the Bloor Street bike lanes have, have had, had several public um, uh, uh, discussions and, and opportunities for people to give their opinions. I was at a meeting um, prior to the last um, TAC meeting, um, and it has gone to Public Works. Um, Public Works approved whatever version that ended up being there, and now it goes to council. I forget what date the council is meeting, but Mike, uh, sorry, yeah. By, perhaps by way of a, uh, of a comment to the report, uh, the, the recommendation that's coming to council includes reviewing some of the accessibility concerns that have been brought up. Um, there's no timeline uh, for their implementation, but the instructions are to, to staff to, to address them. Now, most of the most of the concerns that have been, at least been brought up as part of the dialogue were more around accessible parking, 
uh, and ensuring that there was uh, that the, there was pickup and drop off areas um, that were identified, and, and staff are going through the process of seeing what what more can be done with the existing lanes to make them more accessible. Thank you, Councillor Leighton. But but I, I don't think it would be out of the question to as part of <clears throat> because there's no timeline and, and we wouldn't go and throw new paint down at this time of year anyhow. Uh, we've probably got about four or five months until we go and, and make some of these changes. Uh, and B Bloor Street actually between Bathurst and Spadina is going to go through significant construction uh, in 2018. So um, I, I think we've got a little bit of time now to perhaps uh, invite the, the cycling unit to come and present and, and as Monica raised, um, maybe talk about what lessons have been learned from, uh, from other bike lanes as well. Like there, there, there are other examples. Now that the lanes are permanent, we may be able to do a, a little bit more in, by way of permanent uh, interventions to make it both safer for cyclists and pedestrians as well. Thank you, Nicole. Um, so I'd like to um, respond to Yin's concerns and also confirm that my conversations with um, with other staff on the matter, there was still time to receive more consultation, more input. Um, with regards to the fact of um, you know, potential high risk situations that you feel um, to require immediate attention, um, using Toronto 311 is the most direct approach to document the concern. Um, we do keep track as far as um, you know, the number of reports and things like that, but it's also the fastest channel for you to have somebody assigned to go out and inspect the situation. So where you do see signs of um, something that is a, a safety or emergency concern, that is the, the first step for reporting it so that it doesn't, I mean, obviously the rest of the approach is for removal of systemic barriers so that there's um, an ongoing uh, reliable approach to make sure that these types of barriers are not repeated in the future. But for the immediate short term, if you have concerns, please report them by 311. Thank you for the working groups for the reports. Um, could you please remember to submit the minutes from your working groups to the city clerk prior to the agenda deadline so they may be included with the agenda? And I need a motion to receive. Stephanie. All the Monica, you have a question? Yeah, just a quick question. Can we just have a quick reminder when the deadline is for the December 4th meeting? Janice? November 20th. November 20th at noon. Okay, okay. Okay, now, item number two, Ramson Park Revitalization. Hillsborough entrance ramp. Nicole, you want to introduce? Uh, so today we're hearing from uh, Dave Nosella, Project Manager, Capital Construction, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, Dan Connolly, Senior Project Coordinator, Parks, Forestry and Recreation, and um, sorry that the other staff member is not listed here and she'll introduce herself momentarily. Um, they're here to give a presentation and seek your feedback on the proposed redeveloped entrance to Ramsden Park from Hillsborough Avenue. Thank you. Thank you very much for the opportunity to address the committee today. Um, Ramston Park, uh, the project, uh, or Ramston Park itself is like 13, 13.7 acres located in, in Ward 27, nestled in between um, Young Street on the east, Avenue Road on the west. Uh, on the north side, it is bounded by homes fronting onto Roxborough Avenue, and on the south, uh, where the Hillsborough access is, it, it's, uh, it's bordered by, um, essentially, that's Yorkville. Um, it's a very well-used park. It's, uh, there's a lot of amenities here. Um, dogs off leash area, uh, eight, tennis, eight tennis courts that are public, uh, playground, waiting pool, uh, um, 
walkways that are very well used connecting um, many people to and from the retail areas on the main, uh, main streets and the subway station on Young. Um, there's an outdoor ice rink as well, a small ball diamond. Um, the, the focus of our, you know, the focus of our project uh, originally was, was to go in and fix things. It was, it was funding for state of good repair. Uh, the park had, I don't want to say it's been neglected, but a lot of the amenities were built um, 25, 30 years ago and older. So up on the screen now are some uh, images of the condition of those, that's primarily the tennis courts, um, the leaning fences, the, the poor condition of the surface. The, you see a lot of those timber retaining walls throughout the park, which was how things got built at that time and a lot of them now are degrading and falling apart. So that was our focus at the start of the project, but based on discussions with the councillor and um, the Residents Association, uh, ABC Residents Association, um, the, the, the focus shifted towards more of a larger scale revitalization. Um, so on that basis, we hired a, a, a landscape architectural consulting team and, in, and initiated an extensive uh, stakeholder and public consultation process. Uh, so this is, uh, up on the screen now is the concept plan showing uh, what park improvements are taking place. So primarily, um, uh, the focus was to, to um, improve the main east-west connection from Avenue Road through to um, Young Street, given the amount of use it gets, pedestrian cyclists. Uh, general park users and to improve and to improve the amenities, the condition of the amenities there uh, that are already existing. It was also determined through the consultation process we added a small sports pad as well. Uh, in terms of the topography of the park, it's important to understand that it's a remnant ravine. It's so um, the grade between Avenue Road and, and Young Street is is pretty level but it still retains its, its, uh, its former ravine topography. So access from Roxborough in the north, there's a quite significant grade change. And similarly from the south, the Hillsborough, from the Hillsborough Avenue entrance, there's quite a significant grade change there as well. So um, uh, during that consultation process, it was made clear to us from, from the stakeholders and the people we talked to that the that entrance at Hillsborough was in terrible shape and needed to be needed to be improved. You want to put the, the slide. This image up on the screen now is the um, the lower half of the access ramp and you see the lower half of the stairs. That access ramp, you can switch to the next one. The, um, beyond the stairs looking up to Hillsborough, that's the condition of the ramp. Um, in its current state now, um, and okay, next one, and and that's images of the of the stairs as they currently exist. So clearly, we we can't leave them in this condition. We're obligated, um, number one, to 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 um, keep the assets in the park in a reasonable state of good repair, and and honestly, these weren't. So it was part of the program for us to improve. Um, uh, improve access here. Go ahead. Um, let me catch up to myself here. So, um, considerations uh, in making these decisions. Obviously, the Accessibility for Ontarians with Disabilities Act, it requires us to identify, prevent, and remove accessibility barriers, which this clearly was. The ODA requires the city to incorporate accessibility design criteria and features in all procurement, which we are indeed trying to do in this case, not only at Hillsborough, but it, we're making improvements to the entrances off of Young Street as well. And um, we can't do anything about the access at, at, off of Roxborough. There are steps there currently. We don't have the land or the ability to improve on those beyond stairs. But we do have the ability to um, to improve the Hillsborough access. Um, <clears throat> we
we are <clears throat> we are obligated obviously to consult as well um, for new and and newly developed recreational trails now this we interpreted the, the access off Hillsborough to be not necessarily a recreational trail, but an, a path of travel and an important path of travel for many people using the park. And on that basis, have, um, have proceeded with, uh, with the design that you see up on the screen now, which incorporates a new set of steps and a, a, a fully AODA a compliant accessible ramp. So at this point, I'm going to turn it over to Dan Connolly. He can speak a little bit more on the, on the details of that design. Uh, uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, th so this is the design that um, our uh, landscape architecture consultants that we procured um, uh, came up with. Just to give you a couple of details. Uh, the total topography change from the top of the, the slope to the bottom um, of, of the ravine, which is essentially where the park facilities are, is, is a total of nine meters, nine meters long. So the design that you see they've come, come up with is this switchback um, uh, configuration that kind of traverses down, down the embankment. The total length of, of the ramp is 187 linear meters. Um, the slope is a, is a 1 to 15 slope, meaning um, for, these, uh, for every 15 meters of horizontal, um, distance, it, the grade change is, is one meter. And that is, uh, again, compliant with the um, AODA. Um, and you can see uh, the, um, the little areas of uh, beige there, they are um, uh, uh, landings that are, um, that are uh, spurs, uh, spurs out to, to the, um, throughout the, the length of, of the ramp, again, for, for compliancy. Um, and intersecting through, through the, um, um, the ramp is, is a set of stairs. What what the goal was to um, to rebuild not only the ramp but but the set of stairs as well. The photograph that you see um, in the lower left hand corner that is kind of a depiction of of uh, another type uh, another landing that we've built. That is actually in High Park, where um, it, it'll be a metal um, a metal um, ramp and, and stairs uh, with uh, it's 2.1 meters wide with handrails and guardrails on on both sides. Um, so if you go to, to the next slide, so um, just uh, there's there's going to be a fair amount of um, disturbance to that ramp uh, to that embankment in order to build this ramp. Uh, what we've kind of illustrated here is just um, a depiction of the trees and understory that are, are slated to be uh, removed. Um, we, we estimate there's a total of 15 trees to, to, that require to come out and, and, and additional understory trees that, that are, need to be removed in order to construct this, um, construct the, the ramp. Um, our method of construction is to, be, to build it on helical piers, where what we, meaning what we do is we come in and we drill into the ground so we, so we get this, um, uh, sustainable uh, ground and then the, the ramp is, um, um, the ramp is, is elevated above the ground. We found that in these in other parks that we've um, done this kind of a, a, a types of construction of ramps and stairs that um, th this is the, the, the least invasive way of, of, of building these types of, of, of amenities. Um, our consultants uh, took uh, looked at many different considerations and we worked closely with uh, the ravine um, bylaw people to ensure that our our means and methods was, was going to be the least invasive way of actually constructing um, the ramp. Um, and also, uh, so, uh, you know, we're going to be very transparent. We are, there's going to be a fair bit of disturbance to, to the vegetation on the ramp. But if you go to the next slide, there's always an opportunity for, you know, reforestation of, of, the, of the ramp when, once it is built. Um, so, um, again, like where it is right now, um, the construction, uh, we've completed phase one of the construction. Uh, but constructing the ramp is, is slated to be uh, built in phase two. We currently have a contractor on board, on site, who's uh, 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 currently building, constructing stage one, and we're anticipating this to be um, the next stage of the phase two construction of this project. So I think with that, I mean, um, I don't know, we'll leave it open for uh, questions or? Um, I have a question. Overlapping uh, stairs and ramps, 
because handrails can't be continuous if the ramp is broken up by stairs? Yeah, again, we've, um, we've, we've uh, uh, given that question to our consultant to ensure that, uh, like the direction to them was to ensure that the design that they come up with is compliant with the, with the um, AODA. So, okay, thank you. Okay, um, now I'll take questions from the committee and, and then um, comments. We have three people, one for the back. First, okay, all right. <coughs> so, um, Captain? All right, uh, we have speakers from the public, Mr. Parker. Yeah, if you could come and sit. In the oh, if the staff, the staff. Yeah. yeah, okay, thank you. Mr. Parker, uh, you do your deputation now? I believe that if I could ask for you, perhaps someone else will move ahead of me. Okay. We only have one speech. That would be perfect. We have another. Okay, then. Um, ABC Residence is the second presentation. Are there any other speakers on this topic? Okay. Just, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, we have a presentation following from ABC Residents Association, but we would like to hear deputants on this particular topic, the presentation from staff. If you receive any questions and comments from staff, then you have the separate presentation from ABC, at which time staff may be responding to questions as well. So, if ABC is speaking to this item. ABC is presenting on the item. No, if they are deputants, just like anyone else, they have five minutes to speak. So whoever, if they've ready to speak on this item, they ought to come forward unless Mr. Parker is ready. There, he's ready. That would be ideal. Yeah, please, Mr. Parker, thank My you. Apologies, I didn't realize I would be up so fast, so. Um, okay, um, first of all, I wanna say good morning, and I also wanna thank you very much for allowing me to speak today. Um, I'm here because the homeowners, and I'm gonna give you the numbers, at 13, 15A, 19, 21, 23, 25, 29, which is my home, 31, 33, and 35 Hillsboro strongly believed that the planned ramp is a vital and necessary part of the Ramston Park revitalization and should be built. Currently, there isn't an easy or safe way for a person who isn't an able-bodied individual to access Ramston Park from the south side of the park. Yes, they could enter Young, from Young Street, but it would be a challenging hike for anyone that relies on any device for mobility. It has been proposed that the existing path be upgraded, but quite frankly, the existing slope is far too sleep, steep for someone using a wheelchair, walker, or other mobility device that would not facilitate access for these individuals. It has been suggested that there isn't a need for this ramp because no one in the neighborhood will use it. On the contrary, two of my neighbors cannot currently access the park from their homes because of the treacherous steps and the steep slope. 
one who walks with a cane and the other who is legally blind have indicated that having easy and safe access to Ramsden Park would make a huge difference in their lives. It is impossible to say if the residents of Belmont House will use the ramp or not because they have never had easy access to Ramsden Park from Hillsborough Avenue. No doubt there are many who would prefer the peace and tranquility of the park to the never ending flow of traffic on Belmont Street for their daily walks. With the exception of the two homeowners mentioned, none of the Hillsborough Avenue homeowners who support the project have anything to gain from, building, from the building of the ramp. We are all able-bodied individuals and none of us has a personal need for it, at least not yet. We simply believe that this project is good for all the residents of the neighborhood and the city. Ramsden Park is a special piece of tranquil green space in a bustling downtown core that it should be accessible to all. The proposed ramp doesn't diminish the park's value, it adds to it for more people. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Parker. Councillor Lee, can you have a question? Yes, thank you very much. I hadn't thought about this because <clears throat> I didn't realize you could access, F F Belmont House could access the park through Hillsborough rather than walking around. I, pardon me. Um, Jeez, I hope my wife didn't just go into labor because that would, that would be really not good for me right now because I'm going to ask this question. Um, so my, my great-grandmother uh, was, was 35 years in, in Belmont House, died at about 110 um, just, uh, just five or six years ago, yet the women in my family live a long time. Um, and we spent a lot of time sitting in front. They, they have some, some, some pretty grounds, but there's a big parking lot on the site, right? If I remember Belmont House correctly, there's a large parking lot. There's park, yes. Yeah, and it's like they've got a small grounds, but it's not a, a park by any means. Is there any, there's no access, or no one would walk to Avenue from Belmont House to, to enter the park, correct? I would not think so. That's a pretty, that's a pretty yeah, significant it's walk. Fine. Now east, Belmont House is at the foot of Hillsboro, between Hillsboro and McMurrick, McMurrick, something like that? Yeah, it's, uh, I guess it is. Um, and so to access the park currently, the the residents of Belmont House would walk east on Belmont, north on Young, and then... You know, they could come across Belmont if they were willing to risk their lives. Sure, come up, the only safe. Come up the lane and then enter the park. Yeah. The current means oh, the look, my great-grandmother, my Nana, drove until she was about 90 and had one of those cars in the parking lot there. But there was no way we were taking a set of rickety old stairs with, uh, with, w with her. Um, so currently, there's no way for really no reasonable way for the residents of Belmont House to, to enjoy the park. But by providing an accessible access there, we're cutting it down, cutting the walk down significantly, right? Correct. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that. Thank there you. There is another, I, and I know it's not the committee's responsibility, but there is another issue which I want to raise with the councillor sometime. And that is that laneway between Belmont and Hillsborough, but I won't go any further on that. It's beyond the scope of our current report, exactly. but I'm sure the local I'm councillor would I, happily I uh, meet with you on it. Thank you. Councillor Davis. Uh, I kind of missed the beginning. You were listing some numbers. Those are the residents that you're speaking on behalf of, all of Well, I won't Roxborough? say I'm speaking behalf of. Those are the residents of Belmont who I have spoken to, okay. was able to speak to who indicated support for the project as it is. Okay, have you been involved in no. anything um, to do with the design of what, the park? No, and um, what transpired quite simply was about a week ago, I became aware of what was happening vis-a-vis -vis the, the ramp, the accessibility to the park, um, and became aware of the committee meeting today. So as of, I guess, roughly Wednesday, Thursday of okay. last week, I started to knock on doors and speak to my various neighbors. So there's a, another group of houses. That's not the complete list of houses. I would admit that. Uh, there's another group of houses who I haven't had a chance to speak to. Okay. Or I do know there's one person who is concerned about the cost of the rent.
But it's the general view, in your opinion, that this access is desired by From the most the directly affected residents. Homeowners I spoke to, yes. Yeah. Okay, thank Definitively. you. Definitively. Are there any other questions? Any comments? No. Okay. The next speaker from ABC Residents Association, Katrina Bohar. Uh, could you please introduce yourself? My name is Bill Stevenson. I'm the secretary of the ABC Residents Association. And uh, I'm with my colleague, <coughs> Mary Helen Spence, who will make our presentation. But because of the number of references from Councillor Layton and others to the Belmont House situation, I thought the committee should know that we've been in touch with the CEO of Belmont House, Maria Elias, and she has reviewed the city's design and she has reviewed alternatives that we've discussed with her, like the Earl's Court Park path, and our presentation will talk more about that. And uh, she has reviewed uh, the work done by our uh, consultant, who will be also discussed in a couple of minutes, Michael Spaziani. She's told us that her residents would not use the city's design. She said it's, that ramp is uh, to her wheelchair clients a frightening proposition, as she put it, and would cause them great anxiety. Uh, she is looking for a gentler approach uh, to accessing the park for her 140 uh, bed <coughs> seniors home, the biggest perhaps in Midtown Toronto. And she's offered to work with the city and with the community to find a better solution. And she also points out that it's actually a little closer for her uh, clients to access the park through the Young Street entrance presented by the city uh, than the city's proposed uh, ramp. So those are my comments on behalf of Maria Elias, who invites any of the members of the committee to consult with her further if they're interested. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is like a third party um, interpretation of a comment by or comments by uh, someone who is not here. And so it's difficult for us to rely on what we hear from you. So I don't know how to deal with this um, other than I presume. Um, did she give permission for you to come and speak on her behalf? These are almost her exact words, Councillor. And yes, okay. she did. Okay. It's not usually the way we get information from... Uh, from no. Okay. Thank you. I understand. Monica? Um, I'm just curious if you could elaborate on why they... I'm sorry with the machines in the way. Um, if you could elaborate on why they find it so scary. Perhaps the only way I can really answer that is to just refer back to uh, the slide that you presented of the switchbacks, the ramps, and... Uh, okay, um, we're going to have the ABC Residents Association do their presentation first, then we'll have questions and comments after. Oh, there's a speaker here. The questions of the speaker, they get five minutes each. And then there are, Councilors, no, he's excuse me. His, he's referring to his presentation. Excuse, excuse me. He's his his presentation. It doesn't matter, this man has just spoken and the members of the committee have a right to ask questions. And if what you're saying is that the content that he's referring to is coming next, then the members can use their judgment about whether or not they would ask questions. That's all. I think the answer to the question put to me is a combination <clears throat> of the fact that this 
major metal ramp is elevated off the ground, has many switchbacks, and uh, although technically in conformity with accessibility engineering, looks uh, risky. I think she told me the average age of her clients was 90. And was there no way to make a path accessible with the proper gradients on the ground down that hill? Uh, Martin? Yeah, just a quick question. As a blind person, I don't know how many switchbacks there are on this ramp, so I'd like to find out how many, please. Thank you. Uh, we'll hold that question for staff. Sorry, I wasn't aware. There's a total of five, and, five switchbacks. On. Yeah, we're holding the, that. Okay, any more questions for the speaker? No? Okay. Um, thank you for your presentation. The ABC Residents Association has a presentation on the item. And please come forward and introduce yourselves. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. <clears throat> um, thank you for uh, hearing us today. My name is Mary Helen Spence, and I'm with the uh, ABC Residents Association. Um, Andrew Biggert is, is also going to be giving a presentation after I finish mine. Um, he is a, a lawyer for ABC, and we've uh, asked him to advise us about uh, the ODA and the accessibility guidelines so that Whenever, whatever we suggest or whatever we talk about, we're sure that we're in compliance with, with those regulations. Um, and if I may just very quickly to assure the committee, my presentation will be part of ABC's presentation. I'd just like to confirm whether we have five minutes or 10 minutes as a presentation, because I'd heard 10 minutes earlier today, but I'm seeing others are getting five minutes. Five minutes each. Five minutes each, that's fine. We can, okay. Um, uh, uh, the, Re the ABC Residents Association, um, uh, the park is in our area, um, and in fact, uh, the park, uh, the ABC Residents Association was um, was formed 60 years ago to, in fact, protect the park from the development of two high-rise towers. So the wet half of the park, the west end of the park, is there because of our advocacy, and we're very proud of it. And in fact, we volunteer and work very hard to maintain it. The picture on the screen is a picture of the park. We feel it's a treasure for the city. It's heavily treed. It's a tranquil oasis in the center of a very hectic place. Um, Unfortunately, uh, this particular um, project on Hillsboro has caused controversy in the community. There is discourse. We are saddened by that. Um, we feel that we can, with the cooperation of, of the city, the staff, um, do a better job than what is being presented before you today as of this 186 five, five switchback area. And we would like your help to help us solve this problem. We think there should be more community involvement. We think there should be a consideration for alternative options. And we want to arrive at a solution that we can celebrate and be proud of. We don't want discord. We don't want controversy. We want to cooperate, and we want to find something better. 
I want to give you just a very fast overview of what has happened and what has caused this discourse. Um, on the next slide, we're going to show you a picture that we were shown um, by uh, the PMA construction company that is doing uh, the construction. This was presented during the consultations. This picture before you on the screen, which is, it looks like a gentle sloping pathway, not an elevated ramp. We were also shown the next slide, which is another picture. It seems to be photoshopped of a, a pleasant sort of a picture of something that hovers above on its own without any support. Um, and it looks very beautiful. Uh, and this is basically some of the images that we were shown during the consultation. We were promised that once working, uh, working drawings were produced that we would see more, more material. And recently, after a lot of questions, we in fact were provided with a picture that you've just seen from staff. It's, it's a picture from above. It only shows the, the, the ramp uh, from the top, basically a line drawing. It is, as you see, five very large and very long switchbacks that are going to come down the hill. We wanted more information about the construction and we were told to visit Balmy Beach. And I think that some of you are probably aware and maybe have even used the Balmy Beach ramp. Um, we were shocked when we saw it. We think it's an aggressive industrial steel st structure. It's not in keeping with the natural beauty of Ramston Park. And as a result of this, and this is the only information we had, was the uh, top-down line drawing and this thing. One of the uh, residents photoshopped uh, this potential ramp on the hill. And this is a photoshopped image. We, it's not, you know, we don't know what, the, what it's really going to look like because we haven't been provided with any real uh, three-dimensional drawings. But we certainly don't want to head in this direction. We can do better. We know we can do better um, than a five, 186 five switchback area. We think that accessibility should be beautiful as well as functional. We think that in fact this design on this hill could be a benchmark for good accessibility design in the city, something that we can all be proud of and celebrate. Um, our goals are to achieve that. And in fact, we have options and the city has already uh, produced options and I'm going to let you, Andrew tell you about those. Thank you. Thank you. Now, just very briefly, if I may, I was retained by ABC to make sure that whatever ABC would be speaking to and would be presenting is a, a proposal that would be in keeping with the AODA. Uh, the Residents Association would like to make certain that we have a access to this park that is universally accessible, but also fits within the feel and design of what is uh, Ramsden Park. And an elevated metallic ramp uh, is not in keeping with what is um, the feeling of Ramsden Park and would in fact be a detriment to Ramsden Park. My client is looking for something similar to what you'll see on the slide there, which is Earl's Court Park Walkway, uh, where it is a pathway uh, with uh, access available, uh, again, universal access into and out of the park in the area. And um, it has been performed by the city before as well. The city has retained a landscape architect and an architecture firm as well. Mr. Spaziani, if we could go to the next slide, please. The city. You have retained. Sorry, we have uh, retained. The next slide, please, if we could. Mr. Spaziani, who has looked at a development concept for this specific site. And you'll see that the, the drop at 9.6 meters, his design comes up with a 5% slope. Now, I just heard in the presentation uh, this morning that the city's design has a 1 to 15 slope with the five switchbacks. Well, a 1 to 15 slope, by my math, is about a 6.6% slope. Uh, this slope here uh, is a 5% slope at 192 meter lengths, but it is really a pathway on. Uh, in-ground in pathway that leads down into the park and allows for a much more uh, pleasant access with a uh, proper flow through for pedestrians, uh, anybody in a wheelchair, uh, the people pushing uh, carriages with babies and so forth. It allows for access in, in the park. 
My client would like to make certain that before any determination is made with respect to what uh, access will be provided to the park, that it has the opportunity to continue on with negotiations with the municipality to make certain that the concerns of the citizens are, are considered and that we have some input into what the final design would look like. We're, we're very much concerned with what will be a metallic elevated structure in the park rather than something that would be more pleasing to the eye yet still allow for the same accessibility. Uh, what, what we're looking for, quite simply, is to make sure that at the end of the day, there is an access to the park that everyone can be proud of, both the, the city itself and uh, the residence groups. We'd like uh, an access to the park, as it says there in the slide, uh, accessibility the community will celebrate for years to come. Uh, we want something that, again, is welcoming, pleasant, yet obviously clearly functional. Uh, and a model for cooperation between the city and the community, we say will make this happen. We'd like to work with the municipality to make certain that it is a development at the end of the day that really does function properly, yet still is aesthetically pleasing and in keeping with the beautiful feel that Ramsden Park has. So um, it, subject to any questions that the committee has, happy to answer any questions, but that is the position of ABC. Councillor Davis. Um, do you have qualifications in accessibility design and ravine uh, uh, construction and preservation of trees or anything like Myself that? Myself personally? Yes. No, I don't personally, but the group that we have uh, retained, Mr. Spaziani, is in fact hired by the city many times as an architect. We okay. have landscaped architects who are qualified in that field and um, tree preservation as well. We have looked at the tree preservation as well in that area. And from and our count, the loss of trees would be roughly equal to what is um, to be lost with the city's, pres the city's presentation. Okay, uh, that was going to be my next question because the kind of construction techniques that are required for a landscaped path versus a suspended path would impact tree roots. So uh, yeah. I'll ask, I will ask staff. Um, we also um, looked at the Earl's Court uh, pathway, which was just finished by the city. Uh, it was opened in May of 2015. Uh, it meets the requirements, so it obviously must have met the requirements of the city and, and the accessibility requirements. Um, we are, you know, we only had a very, very short time. We didn't even know about this committee meeting until a few days ago. Okay. So we've scampered to, to try and consult with people and try to get advice. And we think we can do better. We think there are other options and we want the time and the opportunity to explore those. There have never been any other options provided to us. Okay. So the AODA has different requirements and I'm no expert on it. Uh, for recreational pathways yes. and for walkways, walkways or regular uh, access routes. Yes, we understand that. This, um, this particular one that our, our architect has designed is for, it meets the, the sidewalk path regulations of guidelines of the City of Toronto. Okay. Same as the sidewalk pathway guidelines. Okay, you're aware that this is already under construction or the preliminary work is already being No, done. we're not aware. No, well, no. my understanding okay. is it's not. Thank uh, you. Any other questions? From the no, no, committee? Oh, okay. Um, the questions are for the uh, working group. Okay, uh, thank you for your, oh, Monica? No. Yeah, we're, we're doing that. Okay. Uh, thank you, and could the staff return? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for listening to us. All right, could the staff return to the table? Or, or question from there. Anybody else who wants to speak to the item? Okay, if you could come up to the table and introduce yourself. Yes, thank you very much. You will much. have five minutes each. Thank you very much, Madam Chairman. Uh, my name is Bill Schiller. I reside on Hillsborough Avenue. Uh, I just wanted, I'm sorry, would you like me to sit? Okay. Okay, 
Yes, my name is Bill Schiller. Uh, I reside at 35 Hillsboro. Could you turn on your microphone, please? Okay, is this, is this okay? All right. My name is Bill Schiller. I reside at 35 Hillsboro Avenue. Uh, I haven't come with a prepared uh, presentation, but my remarks will be extemporaneous. The first thing I'd like to say is uh, I appreciated the uh, presentations by uh, Mr. Parker. I think he spoke uh, extremely well on behalf of the residents, uh, the majority of residents on Hillsborough Avenue uh, with whom he consulted. Uh, the ABC presentation I found interesting. Uh, however, the ABC people have never come and consulted uh, those of us who reside on Hillsborough, certainly that I know of. I've had no contact or approach from them. Uh, secondly, I would like to say that uh, when a, um, when a lawyer representing that organization comes forward and speaks at length about uh, technical matters and aesthetic matters, I'm rather taken aback. I simply thought that as a lawyer, we were going to have a five-minute presentation on legal implications uh, with regard to this project. Uh, I didn't hear anything about that, but uh, if there are legal considerations that the lawyer has, I'd certainly like to hear them either you know, after this meeting on a one-to-one -one or in some, some other venue. Uh, this presentation uh, neglects the fact, the ABC presentation, that uh, there was a long public consultation about this project. Uh, in fact, uh, as, a, as a resident on Hillsborough, I can say that I participated in a number of meetings and I thought that the councillor, Kristen Wong Tam, uh, did an excellent uh, job in terms of consulting uh, not only the citizens on, uh, on Hillsborough, but uh, everyone who uh, has an interest in this in the city. Uh, in terms of the controversy, uh, there was no controversy uh, about this project until about uh, uh, seven or eight weeks ago when people uh, showed up in the park, uh, some of whom uh, told me that they were supporters of the ABC Residents Association and they started to take uh, uh, a, a petition uh, and they continually harassed people who were passing through the park, and this went on for a long time. Uh, that's the only point in time when controversy actually arose. Uh, but I would say, first of all, that the, uh, that the residents on Hillsboro, uh, in the main, uh, support this. I, I can't say that it's a, uh, uh, a unanimous decision, but certainly the majority of them do. We would like to see it go ahead. We feel that it's important uh, that this park have accessibility. Uh, I, I would be remiss, too, uh, if I didn't say that I'm absolutely appalled that any organization can come to this podium and uh, say that they have uh, the capacity, uh, quote unquote, I guess, to speak for uh, Mrs. Elias, who's the CEO of, uh, of Belmont House. Uh, quite frankly, I think that uh, that, that evidence, if you will, uh, should, be not, should not be considered by this committee. Uh, I simply want to say once again that I, I wholly support uh, the, uh, the, the campaign to have proper accessibility here. Uh, I, uh, I applaud uh, the councillor's efforts in terms of the public consultation and why this is coming up now uh, really leaves me mystified. But I thank you for your time and I hope that you give serious consideration to the people of uh, Ward 27 and to uh, the people on Hillsboro, uh, we would very much like to see this project move forward. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, could you please um, come up and introduce yourself? Thank you. Good morning. My name is James Murphy. I'm a resident on Bishop Street, about two blocks from Ramsden Park. I'm one of the harassers that Mr. Schiller has referred to. My wife and I have spent considerable time in the park uh, discussing the usage of the park with people who are actually using it. I want to emphasize that Councillor Wong Tam has said that this entrance off Hillsborough is meant to be a gateway entrance. So I think we're not building it just for the residents of Belmont House, nor the residents of Hillsborough, but for the entire community. To that end, my wife and I have spoken to over 300 park users and collected 150 of their names on a petition uh, to say that everyone is in favor of improving accessibility to this part of Ramson Park. They just don't wish to see this ramp built in Ramson Park. 
That is, that's the simple issue. I'm not sure what else we're debating. We're debating the right of people to uh, express their views on things despite public consultations and whether or not Belmont residents will go to Avenue or Young Street to access the park. I think really the only issue here is whether we're going to have a world-class design for a gateway entrance that Councillor Wong Tam wants to see implemented for the entire community and the users of Ramson Park, which is a wonderful community asset. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any questions for the two speakers? No? Any comments? <coughs> okay. Okay, can the staff come back? And uh, if there's any questions from the committee? Monica? Okay, I'm taking a speaker's list. I'll let you guys get settled. Okay, I have a two-part question. Um, first of all, I'd like to know how accurate the, um, the image that we were shown by the ABC group about the metal structure is. Can we put it, is there any way we can put it back on the screen? We've, they already said it's good to open for questions. No, no, I said if we can get the image back on oh, the screen. Oh, okay. Sorry. Oh, sorry. They're, they're <clears throat> The image that the ABC group showed us with the metal ramp, that structure that's elevated and this one, uh, no, the view, no, one. yeah, that one. No, no, you're going in the same. That's an accurate. That's an actual. Yeah, that's an actual one. Is yeah. is that what it's going to look like in okay, the park? That one there. Yeah. yeah. Um. Yeah. I mean, I don't. Just first, I I saw it the first time as, as you are. Um. Well, obviously, you can see like the traverses from the from the top of the trees. It's it's hard for me to for me to just sit here and and and, and, and ditch on, on it. But um, I don't know in, in terms of answering your question the the accuracy of it. But the way it, it illustrated it shows that the um, the uh, the structure is front and center. I mean, what we would do, and, and I showed in one of my slides, is our anticipation was to reforest the area to um, incorporate the um, the the ramp. Um, more, in, more into the embankment and into, into the Okay, green. thank you. Um, my second part of my question then is, has anybody considered anybody with low vision or complicated vision that cannot walk anywhere with see-through sides? And why metal in a place that has winter? It's gonna be slippy as hell. And also, um, elevated that high is gonna scare the shit out of people. Yeah, so, again. pardon my language. Um, but it's, it's, I would not be able to take that ramp. Yeah, I mean, it, it wouldn't really be elevated that high. But again, I just want to reiterate something that I probably didn't bring up uh, clearly enough in our, um, in our presentation was, we worked very closely with the Ravine um, uh, Natural Feature Protection people in terms of uh, what we were allowed to do in that, in that park. Um, and in terms of like a, a meandering path uh, that was grade level would be very, um, we required a lot of excavation and, and, and regrading of that embankment, which you would pr pretty much, I, I would hate to say it, but that in that illustration that they showed us at that 5%, quite honestly, I mean, pretty much every tree in that embankment would have to be removed in order to construct that. So again, we worked closely with Ravine Protection Bylaw, and we, we were working under their direction on what they would allow us to do. And the construction methodology that we uh, came up with is w what we have been doing in other parks, and which um, uh, most prominently High Park, which is considered an environmentally sensitive area with the uh, black locusts, and there's very specific trees in there. That we've over the years we've come up with this methodology. What I was saying earlier about the helical piers, which is the, the least invasive way of constructing these types of amenities in these very environmentally sensitive areas. You're explaining quite nicely the environmental impact. I'm yeah. asking why metal in a place that has winter and why see-through sides? I, th I, think, uh, I think it's important to note that the, um, the metal, the metal uh, on the ramp and the steps is textured. So th th it provides uh, what we found from past experience, a reasonable slip resistance. Um, we're also implementing um, you know, the tactile strips at, at the beginning and the ends of the change in grade. 
I'm not sure, I can't speak with utter certainty that they're, they're gonna be a different or a highlighted color. But we'll look into that. Well, the nosies would be yellow. Yeah. yeah. So we'll make sure that that, you know, that uh, visually impaired are, are, are considered as part of that design as well. You're only considering one small portion of visually impaired. I'm talking about the see-through sides. These are see-through railings. Anybody who cannot judge depth properly will be completely frightened and will not be able to maneuver. Is there any way to make those sides solid? I don't, <clears throat> I don't think that's a fair representation in terms of the change in grade. That, that strikes me as, as an exaggeration as it's coming up over the heights of the trees. It's, it's, it, it shows intent, but, but in my opinion, it shows exaggeration as well. Okay, I just want to point out that that's something that needs to be considered because there are many of us who cannot take any escalators anymore because of the see-through sides. So having a ramp accessing a park with see-through sides is not accessible. Okay, thank you. Um, Martin? Wendy? Um. I don't know if anybody's going to be able to answer this question, but in, in considering the two designs, one of the things that occurs to me is um, snow clearance and how often this would be cleared. So for the ramp to really kind of fulfill its function of being this gateway into the park, for people who can't typically get into the park, snow clearance is a big part of that, right? So, um, and I don't know anything about this. This is why I'm asking a question. Uh, is there much difference in terms of the way that snow clearance is conducted for an on-the-ground path versus uh, an elevated ramp? Are they still going to be happening with the same amount of frequency? Are they still going to be, like, is one going to be more likely to be cleared than the other one? Because this is something that we hear frequently from people on the committee who use wheelchairs that uh, snow clearance is a real problem in terms of accessibility. So I wonder if there's anybody that could speak to that. We're, um, we ourselves do not work for parks themselves, parks operations, that being. Currently, um, in, in Ramston Park, I understand that the main east-west path is, is uh, maintained in the winter, but none of the other accesses are. Generally, we don't um, we don't maintain in the winter uh, steps and ramp structures. Now that pra that um, that's ongoing practice. Uh, based on request, I understand that parks um, will consider if if there's extensive use um, winter maintenance. But I, my understanding currently that that it won't be maintained in the winter. Thank you, Councillor Layton. Yes, thank you very much. This isn't a new proposal. I heard about this on a doorstep in the 2014 election. How long has this discussion been going on for? The money was approved in, in 14, um, and that's when we started discussions on what the project was going to be. So when did the community consultation begin? Uh, I would say in earnest in, uh, in 15. Okay. So it's, it, it's been going on for a couple of years? Quite a while, yes. Uh, were, were any other options evaluated as part of uh, how to make this entrance? Accessible? The one slide that, that uh, ABC showed the, the meandering path was, was prepared by PMA as an early, an early concept. Um, it wasn't taken too seriously at the time because, um, number one, it's a huge cut and fill exercise to, to construct that into the grade, similar to the examples provided the Earl's Court and the Chorley. Like those are, those are larger slopes where you have ability to cut, actually cut a ramp into the slope and with wall, a series of walls establish an accessible ramp. Chorley, it's a much tighter configured space and the slope is much, much steeper. So we didn't think it was gonna be possible without decimating that area and cutting down every tree. So we didn't take it much too seriously. The other thing being that continuous straight run and fear of misuse by skateboarders, um, snowboarders maybe, I don't know. But generally it wasn't considered to be the safer of, you know, we, we figured the switchback was the safer of the two options. So you evaluated yes. that, that option? Yes. Deemed it wasn't appropriate? Yeah. Um, the, um, 
we did the same thing at, at, at Christie Pitts to make the pit accessible, but there we had a fairly significant amount of space, and I don't think the grade was anywhere close to this. Um, the height of the of of the pl of the the ramp, how high is it off the ground? A little over nine meters. The diff the grade differential. No, the grade differential. But high. Oh, the high height of the ramp. High is the um, ramp. Oh, oh, Say when you when you're taken off at um, at the at the top of the grade. Yeah. How how high are you? Yeah. It, it well it, it obviously it starts flush with the grade and. Sure. It, protrudes out probably at the height at height I would have to say six eight ten feet it, it would vary and then it kind of works its way down to meet again flush at the landing at, at the bottom is it higher off the ground at the bottom or at the top I would say through the middle because we're cutting across the slope yeah. so it's coming up um, against the, the slope itself as you get closer to the grade you need to meet it gets lower yeah, yeah. Okay. so but I'm just trying to get an, an idea of when, when I get on this ramp, I'm getting on a grade, and then I'm making a right turn, and I'm walking down, I just how fast and how, how much that goes up. So 10 feet at its... it's yeah, so and it, it... We get like a mean, an average here, just to give us an idea. Of I would say about 8 feet, but it does go up because the grade, uh, the reason for that is because the, in, the embankment that is there right now is so steep. Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Councillor Davis? Um, I understand too from doing pathways in parks and ravines uh, that um, the natural environment's requirements um, are quite stringent. Um, is this um, a ravine that it has any TRCA jurisdiction? No. Mm -hmm. No. Okay. So it it is. It was your design was in order to protect trees and ensure that the AODA standards were met. Is that correct? As best we could, yes. Um, and there are trees, even with our design, there are trees that need to be taken down. Yeah. Right. They'll we're showing having to remove a 19. Um, I think any, any option where we're considering building into the slope would result in much greater tree loss. Right. If you look at the radius of the roots and all of that, um, any kind of grading would have resulted in a lot more right. trees. Okay. Um, I'm not aware of AODA standards related to open sides, um, so I'm not sure who I ask. Are you aware of any AODA requirements on railings and open sides of? Our understanding, oh no, maybe Nicole, you want to address that? Yeah, maybe Nicole. Um, so the requirements for handrails is that they be continuous on either side. And uh, the rest of the requirements are for guards. Um, so it goes on to specify for the, um, uh, for, well, for stairs. I'm going to go to the ramp <coughs> section. Sorry, the stairs were referencing the ramp section as well. Um, so it references the, um, the width, the surface, that the surface must be firm and stable, that the ramp must be slip resistant, the maximum running slope being 1 to 15. Um, the ramp must be provided with landings that um, are at the top and the bottom of the ramp and wherever there's an abrupt change and at horizontal intervals every nine meters so that it doesn't become um, a, an acceleration point. So every nine meters there has to be a flat spot. Okay, um, there has to be a certain space for turning at the, um, at the ends where the switchbacks happen. Um, it discusses the cross slope so that there's, you're not gonna you know, accidentally veer into the um, sides so you can stay straight and flat. Um, where there's uh, openings in the surface, um, there can't be a, um, any greater diameter than two, uh, 20 millimeters so that um, you know, <coughs> things don't get stuck in them or, or pass through them. Um, and any elongated openings have to be perpendicular to the direction of travel. It goes on to explain the ramp must have um, handrails on both sides and the handrails must be continuously graspable. It describes the dimensions of the actual railing. Um, it describes the height and how they terminate so that they don't poke people at the ends. Um, it describes that there would be um, a clearance between the handrails where it's attached so people don't get their heads stuck and things like that. 
um, so the handrails and their supports, um, the loads that they have to um, be capable of sustaining. And that is the description for you on the handrails. It doesn't discuss whether there's anything about um, the, the type of the sides of the, so it, it could have, you know, there's, there's no discussion. It could have um, a, a solid side or it could have, but there's no specification for the sides of the handrails, like the walls of the handrails. Okay, I do think that there's, the building code addresses <laughs> distance between railings and so on. If it were, okay, if it were solid, it would certainly, if it were metal, uh, would contribute significantly to weight. Um, I'm struggling a bit to figure out how, how to resolve the issues here, but anyway, in your view, it meets the AODA requirements? Yes, it does. Um, the other, there, there are some questions, as they mentioned earlier, that the um, designer has to look into with regards to the handrails because both for stairs and for ramps, it describes a continuous graspable handrail. So if you have stairs cutting through the ramp, then it's impossible to have a graspable handrail for the full length of the ramp because there's stairs inter, right? So in the, um, one of the images that was the, um, the design that is, has been... Um, the city's design? The city's design. This one? Yes, so at this point, well, that's an overview of the whole park that you were just holding up, but the actual um, design of the oh, this one. of the ramp itself. Um, keep going. Keep, keep talking. Okay, so the, the design of the switchback, that, yes, that's the one that you're holding now, and okay. thank you, it's up on the screen now for everybody. Um, so the way that the, um, the switchback is currently designed, um, at a midpoint, in the ramp section is a set of stairs passing through it. So there needs to be some consideration or some research done with the designer. Okay. But it's see. level where the steps are. You're saying correct. Just, there won't be but the same it's kind of handrails. Correct. Okay. So the, the question is, you know, if you were not a sighted user, for example, you would be on a ramp and wonder where your ramp just went or what are, what you know what's happening here is the question, right? Or even if you were um, blind, if you're going down the stairs, um, you would expect a continuously graspable railing all the way down the stairs across the landings as well, mm -hmm. right? Okay. So that um, a railing that meets the requirements of the stairs would block the ramp, right? So this, the landing has to have railings too, so that you know where you're going, so you can feel the path of travel, so that you know you're at a landing, but the stairs continue. You wouldn't take your hand off the railing, you would continue across the landing and go down further the next set of stairs. So the okay. um, having the intersection between the two um, may not be the um, ideal accessible design here. Um, Did you th believe there are any other designs that met the Requirements for slope and well, I, I, I might sound cheeky here, but I would just remove the stairs um, Then you can have a, a nice ramp that is continually graspable railing that everybody can use that's universal design Okay, I'll just adjust just one is just to that with in taking out the stairs I just want to reiterate the fact that that length of that ramp is 187 meters long. Again, that's, again, just to be compliant, given the height of the, uh, the ravine. And um, so 187 meters long, I mean, that takes you down the ramp into the bottom of the ravine, into, which is the park itself. Whereas, you know, if you look at it from that vantage point, like even like uh, the access point from uh, Young Street is approximately like 200 meters away. So, you know, it's just kind of like, you're looking at, um, different access points, um, like just to get all the way down the ramp and going around to uh, the Young Street entrance is there's really not much difference without the steps. I didn't understand. Oh, what you the point you're making. The point I'm making is okay. the the well, I guess we, we design the, the the stairs are are, are mainly for the able-bodied people to have more of a direct access point into coming and goings um, into the park from that entryway. Otherwise, it's, it's quite a long way down. Okay. And in terms of the slope question and the, the ramp providing level, um, 
landings after certain lengths, that requirement was met. Yeah, you Whereas can see. a long one slope yeah, yeah, the ramp, meandering the walkway does not meet that. Is that, right. is that my, that's what I've heard. Yeah, the landings are represented in the lighter color on the, on no. the image there. So I understand that, You're, but I just heard that the AODA requires landings, flat services every certain distance. And what my question was, was does it meet those landing requirements of the AODA? And the other meandering path model did not. Is that? If I could. Oh, the other, which other, the one that, that was presented to us? Well, you looked at a meandering. Well, Councillor Davis, I, I was drawing a comparison between the current ramp that's there right now, which is a straight, long, constantly accelerating path um, that is, is very dangerous and steep right now. But any, any new path would have, legally would have to um, have that every nine, every like depending on the angle of the ramp. So if it's one in 20, um, if it's just a sloped walkway, they don't need to have the flat spot every nine meters. But if it's a ramped walkway, then they do need to have the flat spot every nine meters. So in any case, the design would have to feature that depending on the angle. Like they wouldn't be able to, because the AODA requires, so it's legislated. So even if the, um, if the meandering path had a section that was steep enough to be qualified as a ramp, then it would have to have a flat spot every nine meters as well. Which would make it uh, take up an, okay, that's fine, thank you. It was looked at and you didn't believe it was possible without serious degradation of the slope. Okay. Committee members, any more questions? Stephanie? Um, you said there were a number of community consultations. I wonder if you have any statistics on the number of persons with disabilities that were at these consultations. Was there any way to, to know that? Councillor's office, at the public meetings, we had sign-in sheets at the councillor's office. There, um, at all the public facilitations, we had sign-in sheets um, that the councillor's office uh, collected. I, I don't know if they have that um, documentation or not. Anecdotally, I would say at the public meetings, there were, you know, 50 to 60 people. Wendy? I just wanted to build a little bit on what Councillor Davis was asking, um, because it seems to me that everybody's in agreement that the, there should be an accessible entrance. Um, one of the things that Nicole's mentioned is a, is a concern of mine also, is that the lack of the continuous hand railing can be very confounding for people who um, can't see, because where does the hand railing go? That's the way that you actually navigate your way down the ramp. Um, in terms of the consideration between the meandering pathway, because it, it did sound like you had considered a meandering pathway at one point. Um, the meandering pathway was not accepted because of the number of trees that would be impacted. I think that's one of the points you've made. So has there been consideration for the number of trees that would be impacted in terms of the meandering pathway versus this, because you're also taking trees out here, right? So like, how specific did you get in terms of that consideration? And also, in terms of the meandering pathway design that you considered at some point, um, was there a continuous hand railing worked into that? Uh, um, the meandering pathway that we proposed was, was again, an elevated pathway. Um, uh, um, and again, I have to revert back to our, um, that was kind of dismissed early on because of the, the amount of disturbance that it was going to cause um, in the ravine. Um, we had to go to, again to the ravine, Natural Feature um, Protection uh, Department and uh, obtain their approval. So in looking at various designs, this was the, the, the most um, least invasive uh, uh, method of, of constructing it, so, those, so that was the one that they were compliant with, um, agreeable for us to build. Um, in terms of the, um, the, the meandering pathway, I don't think the meandering pathway intersected with the stairs the way this one does, so I would have to I would say, I'd have to go back and look at it, but I would I'd say yes, I think it would have a um, continuous railing throughout.
Um, committee members, any comments? No? Okay. Stephanie? Um, well, I can appreciate the arguments from all sides. I just want to just clarify that this committee is an advisory committee, so we don't have any kind of authority to say both sides get back to the table or anything like that. Um, but I do have concerns about the stairs intersecting with the ramp. Um, I think there are safety issues and I think also users uh, may also feel intimidated by that or scared to use, use the ramp because there, are, there will be these openings along the way. And I think if you have, um, my mother's 92, if I was taking her down a ramp like that, I think she would become very agitated and nervous uh, with this lack of sense of security. So I also agree with the need for um, <coughs> continuous hand railing. And I'm, I'm not sure how you put the ramp and a separate set of stairs, but I, I, I just don't feel the two intersecting each other is a very um, necessarily safe option. I'm not a I'm not an architect, architect, but a, just from a potential user or parent uh, ha having a parent who might be a user of that, I think that would be a concern. Okay, would someone like to um, move to receive this item for information? Oh, Councillor Davis. I'm just wondering if we could uh, receive the item and refer the comments uh, from the committee and the deputants to staff for consideration in uh, the implementation of this project. Did you capture that? Yes. We're just working on the motion right now. I mean, the only thing I would say is this is a very, very challenging. I'm not familiar with the park, but I'm familiar with, with construction in ravines. And um, it's a very challenging uh, slope. It's probably why it hasn't been done before. Um, and I understand this meets the requirements of the AODA. And I have heard, I gather the, the issue with the railing and maybe staff need to look at this. Are there other features uh, that could assist in uh, providing greater predictability through the passes that go over? I don't know, uh, tactile, um, on the ground or other kinds of features that may signal that there's going to be a break here. Uh, I don't know what they are, but what I do know is that the difference between having a suspended construction with pilings versus a landscaped um, and excavated project will make, uh, is are very real and an excavated project down the side of a ravine just will not be acceptable uh, in terms of the protection of ravines, ravines too. So we kind of have competing interests. I know that this is very difficult. I know that accessibility should prevail. Um, but we uh, also have uh, other obligations under in an environmentally sensitive areas. So um, if we refer it back to staff and ask them to explore um, this further based on the comments we've heard today, then Nicole can provide any further input and uh, any other outreach they might like to make uh, to our communities, uh, including the local community, uh, that's in their hands to do that. But I don't think we should hold it up. This has been under uh, uh, development since it was approved in 2013. Consultations taken place over the last three years and uh, I think while it isn't an ideal pathway, when you're attempting to build in these 
very challenging areas with slopes that are this um, different, uh, extreme, we have to try and, and meet the requirements uh, of the AODA for sure and uh, make sure it's accessible, as accessible as we can make it. Thank you. Uh, I'd just like to make a point of clarification, Councillor Davis, that people with vision loss are only one group that are dependent on the railings. No, I, so I, there I are many understand. people that are dependent on the continuous. I understand that. So predictability isn't the only reason that they're necessity. Okay. Wendy? Can I just, while the motion's being worked out, can I make one last comment? And it's around the continuous railings as well. So just, I asked a question about it, but I wanna make a comment on it too, and this is also to reiterate what you're saying, Nicole, that the railings are not just there for people with visual disabilities. So we can see, I think, all of us, how having a continuous railing helps somebody who's blind or has a visual disability. But for people who have uh, difficulties with balance, um, for people who have difficulties walking, um, for older folks too, you think about you know taking your mom up and down a railing or up and down a ramp, they will rely on the railing, the continuous railing as a, as a continuous support throughout traversing that space. So it's not, as Nicole has said, just predictability in terms of somebody who can't see the way that they're going. It's also support in terms of balance or supporting your weight down the ramp. So I just want to reiterate and, and kind of emphasize that I'm concerned about the lack of continuous railing also. And I think that sending it back to taking the, count, the comments from the committee um, and asking for staff to consider that and to especially consider the continuous railing within that context is a good thing for us to do. Thank you. <coughs> I'll speak to the item quickly if we're still working it out. If that's okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I think that this is a this is a good path to take. That Councillor Davis is recommending that we refer our comments to uh, to staff for consideration. One, because as Councillor Davis mentioned, this has been a, a long time in the in in the oven uh, to to come up with an option here that improves accessibility. And I think we all know. Uh, the, we all know the local councillor, and we all know her to be a champion of, uh, of accessibility in our city. And I think that if there is an opportunity to improve accessibility, I have no doubt that she will, uh, uh, she will fight uh, to, to make that happen. I don't think that there is anyone else on city council that would fight harder uh, to ensure that uh, we, were, we, were, we were accommodating every uh, recommendation that, uh, that this committee could, could take. And I, I say that with, with with full confidence, because I sit next to Councillor Davis, uh, Councillor uh, uh, Wong Tam on council, uh, and and the number of motions that she brings forward to ensure that accessibility is on the top of council's agenda is um, is admirable. Um, I also know uh, 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 Councillor Wong Tam to try to find solutions to address issues for uh, for for all her constituents, and I think that uh, uh, with respect to the. Uh, to, to this alternative proposal that was brought to us today. I, I'm confident that staff have reviewed that, uh, uh, that option uh, and have determined that it's just not, not feasible. And that's, uh, while unfortunate, uh, it, it, it's a reality that we need, to, uh, we, we need to move forward and we can't just keep pushing a decision down the road and down the road and down the road. So I, I hope that there's still some flexibility to see if we can address the issues that have brought forward uh, have been brought forward by the committee today, uh, but uh, but the, but the end goal of the project is, and this this aspect of the project I think is a uh, is is a is an admirable one. Uh, it's very easy for a councillor to say, "There's a little controversy in my ward. Let's just shelve the project and not do it." And I know when we were putting accessible paths in Bickford Park and Christie Pitts, uh, there there were those in the community that said, "No, we don't want this this cut uh, happening here into into the side of this uh, embankment." Um, and we had to, uh, we did our best to work uh, uh, as hard as we could to find some common ground. Unfortunately, that's not always, uh, and, and, and not always the case. And sometimes the, uh, the, the, the other rules that were put on, uh, are, are put on us by in protecting embankments and, and, and ravines uh, interfere with uh, some of our other goals uh, as, uh, as a city. And so it's a, a little bit of give and take there. And so I'm confident that the local councillor has done her very best to try to 
address this. Have I sufficiently wasted enough time for you? <laughs> Councillor Davis. All right. I have moved a motion that the comments made by the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee and the deputants regarding accessibility in in particular, the issue of continuous railing be referred to Parks, Forest and Recreation staff for consideration in the proposed redeveloped entrance to Ramsden Park from Hillsborough Avenue. So, Councillor Davis is moving um, motion. Any questions from the committee? Motion to adopt. Those in favor? Okay, carried. Thank you. Okay, item number four. Festival and events funding program criteria to incorporate accessibility requirements. You have it in your package. <coughs> Would someone like to move the recommendations? From Darren Cooper? From the communications group. Yeah, I, I'm, I, I'll, I will read it, okay? Okay, um, this is the recommendation from the communications group uh, that City Council direct A, all festivals and events funding programs require any external organizations seeking funding from the City of Toronto to hold a festival or event be required as part of the eligibility criteria to submit a detailed plan outlining the specific accessibility services that will be offered during their festival or event. And B, the accessibility plan requested in recommendation 1A include information on projects and or initiatives to ensure that any and all communication platforms and marketing material are developed and offered with a focus on disability. That is item four. So who would like to move the motion? The recommendations. Okay, Stephanie. Are all those in favor? All right, carried. Um, next item five is a presentation, public appointments at the City of Toronto. Nicole. Um, we'll be hearing from Matthew Cowley, Administrator in Public Appointments City Clerk's Office, who will give a presentation on the current strategy of engaging underrepresented communities, including the disability community, for involvement in consultations and involvement with and on city boards, agencies, and committees. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for, uh, for having uh, me here today. Uh, as mentioned, my name is Matthew Cowley, and I work in the Public Appointments Secretariat in the City Clerk's Office. So I'm going to quickly just talk a little bit about what we do. I know it's familiar to many of you, but I'll give a quick overview and, uh, as I mentioned, talk a bit about what we do in terms of our targeted outreach to try and create and support diverse boards and committees at the City and uh, go over a few of our processes and talk about some upcoming opportunities. So uh, 
Uh, I'm part of a small team in the clerk's office. We do the outreach and we manage the appointments process for about 40-ish uh, boards and committees and tribunals at the city. And in fact, um, work with Nicole and Councillor Wong Tam on the application process and appointment process for this committee as well. Um, so there are, as I said, a range of boards and committees at the city. Uh, we have public members that influence decisions on everything, uh, the TTC, the Toronto Zoo, Toronto Hydro. We have community centre boards such as those for the 519 Community Centre. We have a board uh, for Waterfront Toronto and we also have advisory committees such as this, Aboriginal Affairs Committee, and we also have tribunals which are uh, have citizen members uh, make decisions for things like the Committee of Adjustment and uh, the Toronto Licensing Tribunal. Just a few examples of, uh, of uh, some of the public bodies that we have. And there's, these exist for a lot of different reasons, but the common thread I think through all of them is that it's engaging the public in a, in a way that um, has a direct influence on city programs and services and bringing a, a diverse public voice to the table. So, when we're doing our outreach for city boards, we take many approaches. Um, part of the way that we try and raise awareness about these opportunities is we have uh, general ad campaigns where we'll, we will have things like uh, transit shelter ads. We actually will have a new transit shelter ad coming out uh, next month that will be across the city to promote public opportunities at the city. We do things like social media. But we've also, in the past couple of years, worked a lot more on what we call targeted outreach. And that's where we look at the boards that we have, the qualifications that are needed for those boards, the types of people, uh, the types of skill sets we need for those boards, and then also um, look at how that intersects with what we can do to support diverse candidates on city boards. So, um, so in doing targeted outreach, for example, to reach uh, persons with disabilities, We've uh, been involved at the People in Motion conference. We've had ads and the Abilities website and magazine. Um, and that's in combination with doing a number of other things, such as uh, doing it reach through Volunteer Toronto, uh, professional organizations like Women Get On Board, which works with women on Bay Street to increase the participation of women on corporate boards, um, the Institute of Corporate Directors, Diverse City On Board, there's a very long list of, of groups, and this is just a highlight of some of them. So as I said, we're trying to get people who, uh, who uh, have something to contribute and want to get engaged. And of course, we want our boards to reflect the city that, w that we live in. So that means bringing diverse voices to the table, including persons with disabilities. So one of the things that we need to do as we do our work is, of course, we need to assess how we're doing uh, in that regard. So as part of the application process, when people apply to join a city board, um, part of the application, as, as many of you uh, will know, is at the end of the uh, application, there's a, a voluntary confidential diversity survey where we ask people how they self-identify um, at various demographic measures in terms of age, gender, disability, sexual orientation, and so on. And we try and use categories that match up with Statistics Canada information so we can benchmark and say, how are we doing against what the census tells us the population of our city is like? So one of the questions that we ask on the application form is about if people identify with a disability. So the question, uh, which was developed originally in consultation with people from Nicole's office, is we say, a person with a disability has an ongoing mental, physical, sensory, or learning impairment which may result in experiencing disadvantage or barriers to full participation in society. Based on this description, do you consider yourself to be a person with a disability? I'm pleased to say that we actually have about a 91% response rate for this question. So the data that we have, at least from our own work, is, um, is pretty rich. So, so far during this term of council, of all the applicants we've received, and there's been about 6,000 or more applications, 6.4% uh, of people who have applied for one of our opportunities identify as being a person with a disability. In terms of the number of people appointed to a city board or a committee or a tribunal, currently 6.7% of appointees 
identify as uh, a person with a disability. And uh, according to the 2011 census, the population of people with disabilities in Toronto was 12.8%. Now I know there's new census data, which actually even some more, which just came out today. So um, we're gonna work with staff who are better at reading census data than me to make sure we can reflect the updated number. I'm sorry I don't have the updated number now. Some of you may know it. But, um, but we're always trying to, to you know, measure how well we're doing and see what we can do, of course, to improve. Just a little bit about the application process because I think it's important to, to um, talk about this and, and something to leave with the committee if there's ways that, that you want to provide feedback to us down the road about how maybe we can improve this if there's room for improvement. So uh, the applications, we encourage people to do it online. We can provide print applications for people if necessary in, in different formats, but um, the way we get the vast majority of our applications is online. We have what we call continuous recruitment for our opportunities. So if someone is interested in joining, for example, the Accessibility Advisory Committee, they don't have to wait until there's a vacant seat and then be aware of that and then send it an application. Someone could apply at any time and then they've, they've put their name into our database and then when the opportunity comes up, we've already got their application on file and it, it would automatically be considered um, when that time comes. So, uh, but when vacancies do occur, of course, that's, that's when we really try and ramp up our outreach and try and let people know, as many people know as possible, about the chance to get involved. The basic eligibility to be on a city board or committee or tribunal, you need to be at least 18 years old. You must be a resident of Toronto. You don't have to be a Canadian citizen, uh, but you do need to be a resident. Um, you can't be a city employee and you can't be a spouse or partner or child of a member of council. That's the basic eligibility. Um, in terms of the qualifications, people often ask, uh, you know, when we do events and we meet people, they sort of ask what boards they may be a good fit for and so on. It really depends on the specific board or committee you're looking at. So um, some of our opportunities, um, it's really helpful if you have a background in, uh, say, finance or uh, urban planning. Other committees, they're looking for people to give more of a layperson perspective on issues happening within that community. So there's really quite a range. We have everything from boards that are official corporate boards under the Ontario Business Corporations Act, so things like Toronto Hydro. We have community level boards for eight different arenas across the city. Um, as I said, we have our, our tribunals, so things like the Committee of Adjustment for people who are really interested in, in looking at planning and zoning and bylaw issues. And then there's boards for a whole bunch of different city services and programs uh, for everything from Exhibition Place. We have the Toronto Atmospheric Fund Board. Um, there's really a range. So the qualifications uh, are all approved by council, and those are detailed on the website. But when people have questions about them, we're happy to answer them. And, and when we're doing our re outreach, as I said, we're really trying to um, attract people um, who want to get involved with their city. And as staff, we try and do our best to help people uh, apply for something for which they could be a good fit and uh, try and make a valuable experience for them. A brief overview just of the selection process. So as I said, I'm part of the staff team that manages the outreach and application process. So we get the applications that come in uh, to us. We help put packages of applications together for members of council who sit on various nominating panels. And those are uh, the work of, of nominating people to all these different boards and committees is divided up amongst these panels. Um, so there's an interview process. The panel then typically uh, recommends candidates to city council and then city council has the final sort of consideration on who the public appointees would be and, uh, and confirms uh, appointments to those boards. So in terms of some upcoming uh, opportunities, as I said, we have ongoing recruitment for, for all the boards and committees, but there are a few in particular that will be coming up early in 2018. So there will be a few positions opening up on the Bill Bolton uh, Arena Board. Uh, there will be some positions on Heritage Toronto. Uh, there are, uh, as you're aware, uh, some vacancies on this committee. And there will be uh, positions also opening up on the Toronto Community Housing uh, Corporation Board. 
So if people have questions about those, you can follow up with me uh, uh, afterwards, and, and I'm happy to, uh, you know, if you have more specific questions about these particular boards. But, um, you know, one of the things that uh, we're hoping to do by, by speaking to this committee and, and hearing from the members is get some ideas about how we can improve our outreach to persons with disabilities and think a little bit more about, we're trying to think a little bit more about sort of the intersectionality of how we can find um, the people who want to be involved in, in city boards and people who have the, the right skills and uh, qualifications that can really support the decision making process but also represent diverse voices including persons with disabilities. So. If people want more information, just it's attached to the end of the presentation. Uh, our website address is there. The, the easiest way to remember is it's toronto.ca slash serve your city. Um, our general email address is appoint at toronto.ca and, and there's our phone number there uh, for office phone number 397-0088. But all this information, of course, would be available through uh, Nicole or, or Janice or, or uh, anyone else involved in this committee as well. Thank you. Is there any questions from the committee? Okay, Wendy. Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have two questions. Uh, one of them is, have you done this kind of looking at the statistics uh, across time? So you were, the, based on the numbers that you showed, it's about half, right? So. Uh, if we have about 12.8% of the population in Toronto are people with disabilities, um, the number around six point something is about half in terms of the representation of people with disabilities who are engaged with the various boards and committees of the City of Toronto. Is that number static across time? Uh, we don't have a long period of time that we could look at right now, um, but we've been, we've done a more detailed tracking of these statistics just during this term of council. We don't have a lot of data from the last term of council, unfortunately, to compare to. Uh, during the past couple years, there has been, uh, uh, there has been a small increase in the number of people, persons with disabilities both applying to and getting appointed to city boards. Um, and I don't have the numbers in front of me, but I do have, I do have some figures that I could certainly uh, uh, get to you. So there has been some increase, but, um, but I don't have numbers going back years and years. Not, not at the moment. Just a couple of follow-up questions. What, what is a small increase like? What would you, if you had to ballpark it? Uh, I think I would, uh, I hesitate to say a okay. number that may be wrong. I think it's probably, I think since the beginning of this term, it's maybe gone up maybe one or 2%, but that's, I, I'm guessing a bit. I'd have to look at the numbers, so okay. um, yeah. Um, so I wanted to also ask about um, some of the, maybe some of the terminology that you used in your presentation. So when you're talking about ramping up recruitment in terms of different kinds of diverse groups, what does that mean? Um, does that mean that you're then just sending things to particular groups? You're more likely to send things for people with disabilities to organizations that represent people with disabilities? Um, or are the positions just generally broadcast to the same groups? Uh, I, I would say what, we, what we're trying to do in general, our, our general strategy, is that we are trying to maintain a, a constant, um, uh, we're trying to keep our outreach constant throughout the term, whether there are open positions or not, so we're always trying to maintain a presence by going to events, by meeting with groups, um, doing outreach through, as I said, through social media, things like the transit shelter ads. So there's sort of a baseline of outreach that we try and maintain. So there's never, um, we always have some presence in, in the public uh, sphere. Uh, but when we know that there are opportunities coming up, that's when we look a little harder at our targeted outreach. So we might say, okay, there's vacancies coming up on the Toronto Community Housing Board. Um, let's look at what the sort of qualifications are for that board, think about some groups that, that may be interested, and some communities of people who may be interested, um, and also look at our diversity info now, and what does it say about what are some of the underrepresented groups currently on city boards, and we sort of use that to, to come together with sort of a, a bit of a, a plan, for example, for each board to say, okay, um, 
you know, are currently, so we're underrepresented in this area. The TCHC board wants people with uh, some familiarity with, with these various qualifications. And that's when we'll look at doing things, you know, reaching out to organizations and saying, there's an opportunity coming up. Could we maybe put an ad in your newsletter or could you send uh, some information out to, to your network or could we come and speak to an event that you're hosting and things like that. So we always try and tailor it a bit to the uh, particular the particular opportunities, but as I said, the, the general answer is that we're trying to maintain a, a constant presence, but then when there are specific opportunities coming up, then think about what we can do to really raise awareness of those particular opportunities. Um, Martin? Yeah, hi. Um, I was just wondering, uh, um, do all committees meet during the day or are there also opportunities uh, in the evenings? Uh, many of them do meet during the day. It depends on the particular one. So some of the, the arena boards, for example, uh, meet in the evenings. Uh, many of the boards and committees which uh, meet during the day uh, are um, uh, sometimes, you know, that some of them meet at City Hall and they're even supported by clerk staff, so those would meet during the day. So the tribunals like Committee of Adjustment, as I said, and Sign Variance Committee and so on all meet during the day. And uh, a number of the corporate boards do as well. So um, I don't have the exact breakdown in, in front of me, but I would say a large number, if not maybe the majority, would, would meet during the day. But there are some that do sometimes meet in the evenings as well. Councillor Davis? I have two uh, questions. Um, one, I don't understand why you don't have data going back to when the policy was approved. Because when I chaired the committee, mm -hmm. we did have all that data, um, and we did use it constantly through the appointment process to measure where is the representation lower. Um, and we, there was a report, I thought, uh, that went to Council at least twice annually that reported on the, or in the term, that reported on um, the results of each round of recruitment and appointments. Yeah, I, have to, I, I, I am aware of those reports and I'll, I'll look at them again. I think um, with this category, I'm not sure if the question was asked oh, the yes. same way, but then, okay. Absolutely. Okay. But the I policy was approved in 2000, well, I think it was, 2005, originally, uh, and so there were measures of the percentage of appointments to the representation in the population uh, by the categories and all of the self-identification categories in the questionnaire. Okay, I'm, I'm happy to look again because I may have, I know for some of our, some of the categories of which we ask people, the, uh, the parameters are not exactly the same, but in this case, there may be more there that I can look yeah, at. Yeah, so, I, I mean, I could say, I, I, I recall the, f the first measures, the first years were very low at 1%, sometimes less than 1% for persons with disabilities. So if we're at 6.4, there's been an improvement. However, <laughs> it's still not representative. Uh, and I, so what one of the reports identified is that the percentage of representation at each stage, the pool of applicants, the shortlisting stage, and then the appointment stage. So you could track mm -hmm. where was the slippage, if that's a proper word to use, but um, between the outcomes and the intent. And so that was when the policy was to do more outreach. And I'm wondering specifically, who do you reach out to uh, to ensure that there's a pool of applicants uh, that self-identify as from the dis disability community? Well, uh, as I touched on a bit in the presentation, Councillor, um, we have done some work, we have reached out to some organizations um, uh, and has been involved, you know, setting up uh, tables at events like People in Motion. We've also worked a bit with uh, the Accessibility Outreach Network through elections. But um, but we have room to grow, and that's and that's some of um, the advice that I think we could probably get from this committee are what are some of the stakeholder groups and that's some of the organizations and so on that we. That's what I was just about yeah. to say. Maybe yeah. you can provide an exact list of uh, and methodology for outreach 
provide it to the members of the committee and they could provide you with any further feedback on where else um, would be an effective, what other methods would be an effective way to recruit new non candidates. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Stephanie? Um, just talking about the application being in available in accessible formats, is there a way of, of someone who is an ASL user to actually have an in-person uh, version of, of completing the application? The reason I'm saying that is because English is not the first language. Mm -hmm. Some of the terminology may be confusing for example, when you say if you are uh, someone with a sens sensory loss, some of us know what that means, but not everybody knows that that includes someone who's deaf or hard of hearing. So just around the clarity of that and uh, um, being able to actually access the application and, and fill it out with ASL interpretation, is that available? It, we'd be happy to, I mean, any, any uh, support that someone needs to participate in this process, we're happy to, to, to meet that. So if there are special things or if there are requests that, that come in, then we can certainly deal with them as they come in. And I, and I will say we have uh, met individually with applicants in the past, one-on-one uh, -on -one here at City Hall, to uh, take them through the application process. And we're happy to do that. And if there's also things within the application, if some of the wording is perhaps um, unclear, or if people have feedback, if there's things that are, if the, if the lingo is maybe not uh, correct, we're always uh, grateful to have feedback on that because we want it to be as, as, as uh, clear and accessible to everyone as possible. Um, and just a follow-up question, is, is there an option to have an actual um, ASL version of the application, like a tab? online, on the online application, a little tab where someone's actually signing what the questions are, because that would feed into a more universal approach rather than individuals having each time to request accessibility. This would make it open to a larger group of people. Uh, I don't I don't know the, the technical answer to that, but I'd be happy to look at it and, and uh, as I said, if there's um, if there's more we need to do to, to make our process more accessible, then of course that's what, something we want to look at. So, yeah. Are there any more questions, Wendy? Sorry, just one more question. Um, what you were saying, Stephanie, sort of raised some things for me. Uh, in terms of the participation of people with disabilities in the boards and committees, um, and this could be something that everybody knows already and I just don't know, but are there, is it clear how somebody requiring an accommodation would request that in the context of participation in these kinds of committees? Because when Stephanie was talking, I was thinking about somebody who is deaf and who is uh, a user of sign language as their primary language, trying to engage with a committee and wondering First of all, as Stephanie said, the questions around application are critical because if the application is not available, it's very hard to take part. But even beyond the application, what happens in terms of, for example, somebody who's deaf that wants to be on a committee, how do they access a sign interpreter? And is that information well known? Uh, thanks for the question. Um, I would say it's, you know, that's probably an inconsistency that we can build upon. So I think. So a number of the committees and boards are for, supported by staff from the city clerk's office. So when people are meeting here, I think we have the benefit of meeting in an accessible building. And of course, we have staff supports who are more familiar with providing support to boards, to, to people with disabilities. Uh, but some of the other boards meet in uh, offsite, meet in community centers or other buildings. And so that's something that I think that, uh, that I can take back to, uh, to our agency representatives because when we're doing, when we're uh, working on recruitments and looking at filling positions on boards, we do uh, reach out to uh, those agency representatives. So we reach out to staff at Toronto Hydro or, or Toronto Community Housing or the Bill Bolton Arena. And um, so I think that's something that, that you know, we can add to our conversation to think a little bit more about, um, look at, how someone with a disability, 
how uh, how well uh, how welcoming that environment would be for them if they joined that particular board and were meeting in a different venue. Are the board chairs familiar with? Do they have an accessibility policy, um, or have they sort of are they familiar with how to support different things at, at in their meetings and so on? So that's something that we can certainly look at and and maybe you know uh, raise that discussion with some of the representatives because I would say it's probably inconsistent. So. Uh, between the different boards and committees. Okay, thank you for your presentation. Um, Miguel? Uh, you have a speaker, a deputation? Yeah. Yeah, please. Oops. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay, could you please introduce yourself <coughs> and you have five minutes. Yeah, I'd like to introduce myself. My name is Miguel Avila and um, I had the opportunity to speak on this important item. Uh, thank you for Rahima for chairing this uh, committee today. You're doing a great job. Mm -hmm. So um, I like, I have questions more than comments, but let's, let's look at this um, graphic that was presented by our, is it on? Sorry. Well, while you do the, um, uh, the technical work, I just wanted to point it out that um, one of the boards and commissions that lacks uh, representation of people with disabilities, be it invisible or invisible. Thank you so much, dude. Um, one of them is my favorite. Oh, I'm sorry. The Toronto Zoo, the Toronto, no, not the Toronto Zoo. The police board. Yeah, the police board doesn't have representation um, of people with mental disabilities or physical disabilities. Um, they currently, um, they lack the participation of the, of the community. As, as it reported, 13.8% of the community of residents in Toronto live with disabilities and one in five Canadians live with mental illness. So I think the number is going up, ready to go down. So we had to ramp up <laughs> the, the, the um, um, but members to participate in these ABCs because we, we are the ones who are, the decisions made by council affect us directly or indirectly. Um, it's sad to hear that the, the committee on, on policing um, did not report anything today However, I want to point it out that last meeting, I submitted information from the police services uh, report on people with uh, mental in, um, um, disabilities in, in their contact with the police. And there's an important chart of information that uh, hopefully you guys have received via email because it shows that clearly Ward 27 and Ward 28, uh, most people are concentrated, the number of calls that police deal with emotional disturbed persons. Well, I don't want to distract more on that area. I just want to say that, for instance, let's see that in the hypothetical case that I get um, selected to a board, to an ABC board commission, I'm a medical cannabis user. I use medical cannabis to deal with my depression and anxiety and other issues. So I wonder, um, under the current policies, would I be arrested <laughs> if I medicate myself? Or, or any other member who declares, I'm a medical cannabis user. Would I be you know, persecuted for that? Would they make accommodations? In my case, I require to have a, a gym hours because being physical, I mean, being, having diabetes, I know my outcomes, I'm gonna lose a limp, or my heart, heart, heart attack, or eye vision. So, I had to keep myself active and in, in, in the, in the ability to have a gym facility really helps me a lot because I like to spend an hour at least in the gym. Second is the medical cannabis. Third, I require a, a time where I need to shut myself off. We talk about hours. People meet in the evenings, people meet in the dates. So in my case, what will be the, 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 the middle ground? In the middle, in the middle of the day, I need to take a nap because that keeps me level and balance. Right now, you see me, I'm unbalanced. I'm, I'm medicated too, but I'm able to express myself, my thoughts in a logical manner. 
what else I need to say? What is the purpose of selecting members at these boards? If, if every each and every time we are um, break, I mean, we are receiving scandals of, of board members who don't have in, 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 in heart the, the best interests of citizens. For instance, the park authority. The parking authority was disbanded because they were going to get themselves in some trouble. And the Auditor General came up with a report. And the other committee, I spoke on that committee as well. Why don't you include people like me? Because I'm a civic, because I'm a, an activist? Mikhail, I care you, about the city. Mikhail, could you you know, I won't be doing things like up? the parking authority. Your time is almost up. Could you yeah. wrap up? Yeah, I'm going to wrap it up. So my name has been on the database for six years. I have applied for the zoo, for the police board, for the TCAC, um, and none of these groups ha I have ever received a phone call, and, and as well, the TTC. That, you know, opportunity has come. And I wonder, is it, am I blacklisted from Great. applying? Thank you. Because I have a mental disability and a, and a physical Thank you, disability. Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions for Miguel? No? Thank you. Matthew, yeah. you can come back. Okay, Matthew, could you come back, please? Okay, is there any uh, comments from the committee members? Uh, Yin? Um, I like. Okay, um, Councilor. Um, the kind of outreach you do. Uh, to solicit imp to solicit candidates for this committee. Thanks for the question, Councillor Davis. Um, I did work with um, the uh, Public Appointments Secretariat, um, but when I'm working, like they did support me with their other outreach methods, but in addition to that, because of the nature of this committee, I reached out to about 30 or 40 different organizations that support people with disabilities and um, reached out to them well in advance to ask them to um, distribute this through their other communication networks, which was a quite successful way of identifying additional people with disabilities um, as, as part of my recruitment activities. Is that the normal approach that you're aware of? And I didn't get a chance to ask Matthew. Uh, oh, I guess I still can. Um, for recruiting for all of the positions on all of the boards, are you using the same process? What, I'd be I think uh, what Nicole described, Councillor, is is very typical of, of what we try and do. So, um, so you know, in the case of recruiting for this committee, of course, Nicole being a subject matter expert, well, one of the subject matter experts of the city, um, if if it were up to us to do recruitment for this committee, we would turn to her and say, "What advice do you have? What have you heard from your committee members? What organizations yep. would you?" Just yeah. in the interest of sorry, time. sorry, is there maybe, a broad and outreach in the in the disability community for all boards as there is for this board? Is there sorry, you can't. as broad an outreach to the disability communities broadly um, for all boards as there is for this board? I see. Okay, I understand. Um, uh, no, I mean I think we. Okay. Okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, finish your sentence. <laughs> No, that's something we, we want to improve on. We want to improve on, you know, that intersection between uh, reaching out to persons with disabilities and reaching out to persons who would be interested in, in all city boards and committees, not just this committee. Okay. Yes. Great. Uh, all right. That that's my question. And uh, no, um, comments, Yen. I'm just here to provide. Um, I don't know if you should go into a motion or not. That. Uh, annually that um, your department comes back and report to us what the improvements have been, especially in the targeted um, percentage. 
and the various ways that you specifically reach out to the disability community, not just for TAAC, but all the boards and committees, because we don't want, um, we want ourselves represented on all boards and committees, as we have already mentioned. Also, as you have mentioned, the, the communication access is very important. So as we meant, recommended to other departments that right at the top of your website, where uh, you clearly say that alternate formats, communication formats or accommodations are available upon request. That's the, that's the minimum. <laughs> so that people who may have ac difficulty accessing the website, and we know that, uh, as far as I know, City of Toronto website is still very confusing um, for, you know, so, so that people can right away know that they can request it. So I, I, these are the recommendations that I'm putting forth that we hear from, uh, from, not, from your department uh, regularly and we hope to see an increase in the, in the percentage of representation on all boards, but also the outreach uh, methods that you're using. Uh, how we like to hear more specific, so it's not just we are trying to do better, but how have you reached out uh, to the disability community? Uh, thank you, Yen. And uh, Matthew, uh, would you ever, uh, please advertise in wheels trans? In wheel trans? Yeah, you can. Okay. Okay, thank you. Wendy? These are comments, right? We're in comment mode? Uh, okay, so I wanted to just kind of um, underscore the concern around uh, people with disabilities only being targeted for what you think are disability specific committees. Um, because we're here because we have a particular interest and our lived experience, but we also have lived experience and expertise in a range of areas, right? So when you're thinking about people with disabilities taking part in the boards and committees, it's very limiting to think that they're only going to take part in disability specific committees. So I really think that there needs to be some consideration made for how, and you were talking about this yourself, in terms of the, the overarching policies, that all of the positions that are available are made available and look to be available to people with disabilities as well. Part of that also involves having an overarching accommodations policy, right? So a policy that talks about how accommodations come to play and are made available to people in the recruitment process, but also in the participation process too. So you were outlining how some of the boards and committees meet in buildings that are not physically accessible, that are not available to people who might be wheelchair users or who might have visual disabilities. And that seems to be problematic because that is actually saying then that that, that committee is not available to people with disabilities. So there has to be some kind of harmonization around that. Um, I wanted to also just ask or mention, because we're in comment mode here, uh, honor area can be quite significant for people with disabilities in participating. And it seems to me that there are some committees that have some kind of financial benefit attached to them and others that don't. But if you're considering targeting people with disabilities, that might be something to consider. Um, yeah, that's it. I just think that really try to be very broad in terms of your consideration around the kinds of skills that people with disabilities can bring because they can bring lived experience and expertise in the same range of uh, things as anybody without a disability too. All right, uh, thank you for your presentation. Thank All you for the opportunity. Any other speakers for comments? Councillor Davis? Um, I have a motion and I should um, move it first, but if you'll indulge me, I wanted, I uh, just looked up the diversity policy and I did want to assure people that diversity um, is completely embedded in the policy and it is the main fundamental underpinning of the policy. It also requires that we recruit people who are skilled and, and it is a competitive process. So we're trying to weave together both ensuring that there's fairness to the process but also that we're doing uh, special outreach uh, and accommodations through the recruitment and appointments process to make sure that we get the diversity that we want to achieve. And the policy itself says very specifically that um, 
There is diversity monitoring. So it says self-identified diversity data at each stage of the selection process, applicant pool, shortlisted candidates, appointed members may be monitored and reported. Now it uses the word may and reported on in summary form. And so they, there is a, re, a reporting process that is embedded in the policy. Um, it also says uh, that our intent is to make sure that um, the diversity, <coughs> that the city has a commitment to open, inclusive, and equitable appointments process uh, and there's another one, something I just read, which is also to support uh, people, all people in their participation. Uh, oh, diversity outreach, city staff um, may also conduct advanced outreach initiatives to ensure that equity seeking groups can be recruited successfully. And there's one other, so the diversity monitoring, reporting, and then there is something. Um, de designated staff shall submit a summary report on diversity results at the end of the recruitment cycle comparing to previous results. And the purpose of this monitoring is to assess how well council's diversity objectives have been met and ascertain what improvements could be made such as targeted outreach and removing barriers to participation. So it's there. I guess the question is how can it be improved uh, to improve our results and to ensure that the barriers to participation really are being addressed. And I think that um, the motion that I'd like to move is that um, we asked Nicole the Accessibility Consultant, Equity, Diversity and Human Rights to review and seek input from members on potential improvements to the strategy for engaging the disability community in the public appointments process, including additional outreach and improved accommodation throughout the process and in participation on all agency boards and committees and report to a future meeting. So it probably should say also in consultation with uh, uh, the public appointments staff, but I, that would make this a paragraph long <laughs> sentence, but the intention, it's not, uh, it's not perfect, but the intention is to say, ask Nicole to reach out to you between now and that meeting to hear, are there other, are there other ways uh, that we could be recruiting, uh, doing outreach and recruitment, and are there other ways uh, to provide accommodations during the selection process, but also in participating in the committees, all agencies, boards, and commissions. So that's the intent. So that comes back in a form that uh, there would be some recommendations that could then be put into action. I hope that makes sense and would be helpful. Um, because as I said, we certainly have an intent to achieve increased participation. And I think the numbers uh, Matthew mentioned today, I'm sure you've all heard the uh, stats can, uh, as a result of the long form census data being released today, uh, the percentage of people who self-identify uh, as having a disability has increased. Um, so has uh, Aboriginal and other groups. So we'll obviously be looking at changing our recruitment uh, objectives uh, as we go through our next round of appointments based on the data that has come from uh, the, uh, the census. Thank you. Um, it's 12.05, if people could stay a little bit longer. Uh, when um, I have a motion by Yin that I can... Uh, that one? Okay. Okay. Okay, I need a motion to receive this. Oh,
Um, I'm going to read out Yin's motion and um, members can decide if it should be combined. Um, you can discuss um, that the city clerk report annually to the Toronto Accessibility Advisory Committee regarding the improvements to the strategy for engaging the community of people with disabilities in the public appointments process, including an update on the targeted percentages and various methods being used to reach out to the disability committee. Separate motions. Yeah. Okay. So all in favor? Carried. And I need a motion to receive item five. That's okay. Do we need a separate, do we need a separate motion? No. Oh, okay. is it voted on? I think you just did. Our, our last item is the draft corporate accessibility policy. Nicole. Thank you. Um, so as uh, we've discussed in the past, uh, this is a very, very quick overview. Um, the committee uh, should generally be aware that there's been a corporate accessibility policy that has been drafted. Because it's a draft document, we're not able to um, publish it and I would like to draw on the expertise of our working groups to give feedback on the policy. Um, so there's a motion that's moved by Rahima Mullah um, that the consultant, Equity, Diversity and Human Rights, consult with both the communications working group and the employment working group to provide feedback on the draft corporate accessibility policy. All those in favor? Carried. Okay, the meeting's adjourned at 12.10. Uh, do we?